On this episode of Contra, I interview Dr. Robert Gifford. Robert is a professor at the University of Victoria whose research is based on the barriers between an individual's beliefs and their actions. Welcome to Contra, Professor Gifford. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so you've written at length and spoken uh, around the world about factors uh, surrounding our inaction on climate change, specifically people who actually understand climate change and believe it to be a problem. Rather, not so much understand it, but um, they, uh, they believe it to be a problem. However, they have these obstacles in their life preventing them or giving them the sensation of prevention of actually doing something to change about it. Yes, um, most people now accept that there's a problem. Uh, in fact, almost everybody now does. Even the skeptics are, the kind of neo-denialists are saying things like, okay, yeah, I accept that it's happening, but uh, I think it's just not very important. And so that's, how, mm-hmm. that's the modern skeptic as opposed to saying that it's not happening at all. Yeah, and I have, I have seen kind of a change in people saying that it's not happening to saying that it's not caused by humans or, or just basically there's just, I I've noticed that as well as there's, there's the the skeptics have kind of changed their tune a bit and they're becoming maybe more nuanced in their, in their skepticism as well. Yeah. I mean, it's an old objection to say that it's all caused by nature. The new one is, yeah, I even accept that humans are causing it because of the Mm -hmm. levels of, uh, of, uh, greenhouse gases so i even accept it at that level that it's anthropogenic but it's just not going to cause as much problems as people say yeah one of the things this is kind of a personal belief that people have these like fundamental religious wirings and it seems people just want to people want to attach themselves to a person or an idea um, a system of of people or ideas so something with when you talk to somebody even on, on behalf that somebody's advocating on behalf of climate change is real and we have to do something about it. I find that a lot of people, they don't understand the science on, on either side. They're just kind of, um, there's to me, it's like, if you replace some of their facts with their, their referencing, you might as well say like they're referencing the Bible or faith or the priests. They're talking about science this way on both sides of it. I've kind of, uh, like I don't, I don't think like fundamentally human beings are scientifically minded, right? It's like it's a discipline you have to train your brain to actually think in that way. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you have, uh, you know, one of the dragons is a kind of religious based one. Uh, on the other hand, I think a lot of the dragons have to do just with which tribe you're in, to use mm-hmm. that. Uh, term broadly I don't mean indigenous but I mean which kind of intellectual or social tribe you're in yeah so that you get a if you're in one of those bubbles uh, you get a lot of pushback if you don't subscribe to the the bubble or the tribe's uh, views which of course can ultimately go back to religious views but I think the more salient uh, proximate problem is being afraid to say something because your neighbor, your family member is, would get on your case about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose, uh, I suppose kind of what I was saying is, you know, let's, let's go back 800 years ago or, or, or something. And if somebody was a non-believer in whatever religion was in power at the time, let's say Christianity, um, they wouldn't say anything because, of course, they don't want to be challenged by their neighbors because their neighbors are all devout believers. There might actually be only a few people in their town that have actually read these scriptures and believe it for some reason above just an authority told me this is what to believe and all my neighbors seem to believe it. Um, and I guess I'm kind of proposing the same thing for for ideas like this in our in our society. Yeah, I mean, we we have in some of our surveys included scientific knowledge as one of the questions. And so we would ask six or eight factual scientific questions. And you're right that the probably the average mean score, I'd have to think about it, but you know, the average mean score out of eight might be two and a half or something. Yeah. And the other 
questions are, are not answered correctly. So it's true that most people, and it's possible that most people on all sides of the issue aren't really up to date with the fundamental uh, natural science of the, of the, of the issue. Yeah, it's so it's so difficult, right? And you can always find, like, the climate change deniers. That's part of the problem is you can always reinterpret data to to be perceived a certain way, right? And make make predictions and make forecasts so that it's pretty compelling to the layperson. Yeah, and the other typical strategy is cherry picking. Uh, you know, scientists in good faith do make mistakes. We all mm-hmm. make mistakes. And so the famous one was the guy who sort of overstated uh, some of the the rate, I think, at which uh, mountains in Nepal or uh, in around Everest were going to melt. And he mm-hmm. he, he made a, an actual mistake. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, he got jumped on by denials and skeptics as representing all the rest of science, etc. Yeah, yeah you know, of course. So, or, you know... Uh, temperature actually rises a a wee bit in washington dc and certain important people there think that means it's the end of climate change yeah and you know what that kind of reminds me of uh i've I've had this exact situation happen to me a few times where somebody will say oh you know this week coffee's bad for you next week it's good for you who knows what to eat and they're just eating like a a cheeseburger and washing down with a soda it's like well no, like these are, you know, these are minor studies that are overblown by the media. And you know that cheeseburger is not good for you. You're just, you know, you're just rationalizing your choice to like avoid common sense. And, and, and which I think now, and that's kind of what I, that's a big question I have about the dragons of inaction that you've put forth for, um, uh, that people, people basically, um, internally are avoiding action, um, based on these dragons. So, the, sorry, I'm kind of rambling here. The question I have is the knowledge of these dragons, is it actually changing people's behavior, do you think? Like if somebody is educated on all the ways that their you know, subconscious processes are tricking them into not acting, will that lead to better outcomes in and of itself? I would like to say yes, but I don't know of any evidence that demonstrates that. Yeah. But I would, uh, yeah, I would like to uh, do a, a study of that. Just how much uh, does awareness that I'm using excuses or justifications, rationalizations, change people? I, you know, you would hope the answer is yes, but I don't have any data on that. Yeah, I, I was speaking to Jordan Alley. Um, uh, he's a doctoral candidate at UVic as well in, in psychology. And one of the things I was proposing is I thought that psycho- like basic psychological knowledge should be imparted on students at a, like in my, in my case, I took a, an introductory psychology course in first year university in engineering. It's the only psychology course I took, but it just gave me these like profound insights into the way, um, the way that my mind works that I've used throughout my life. And I, I thought most of these concepts are not extremely onerous. To, they're not, they're not difficult. It's not like explaining advanced calculus, like something like locus of control. Why not teach this to people in grade nine? And he thought that, um, people being aware of these psychological, um, ideas wouldn't actually change the behavior. Um, similar to how, um, and this is the example I gave to, as a, you know, to actually support his argument is that we talk about for diet and exercise, like, oh, we need to educate people on proper diet choices. And I I actually don't believe that's true. Like, no. And and people in my zone talk about the information deficit model. It's kind of the the whipping boy because the, the, the model is let's just put out information and that itself whether it's about my own justifications or just factual information. Yeah. And lots of studies show that behavior doesn't change uh, simply as a result of information. On the other hand, uh, I, th- I think educating people is certainly a kind of primer, primer, basic, fundamental first step. It's mm-hmm. just that some people think that's the, uh, a sufficient step as well as a necessary step. And yeah. it's, it's not, of course. So there's lots of other things that have to happen yeah i was listening to one of your talks and you mentioned uh, making the right choice for the environment the easiest choice yeah like placing instead of placing 10 garbage bin bins in a recycling bin 
in this in the center of the office, like placing more recycling bins. So you, you have to walk out of your way to go to the garbage bin. Um, and I like I would think that by educating people, even if it's only one out of a hundred people that take it upon themselves to actually make a change, such as changing the structure of garbage bins and recycling bins like that in the office, then it has that trickle on to affect everybody else. Yeah, there's certainly making it easy is one of the cardinal uh, pathways to better sustainability and environmental issues like making bike paths safer using the now that they a lot of them even have, you know, a, a concrete uh, a barrier uh, brings out the people who are more worried about yeah. bicycle accidents and blue box recycling is the mother of all that. I think um, making you know so that we didn't have to drive to some central urban. I used to when I first moved to Victoria, the only place you could recycle was at the the big yard uh, by London Drugs on Mackenzie, and so we used to make this trek every once in a while. That mm-hmm. was far easier to put the blue box out on the street, and yeah, and then and so in bike lanes, um, making it easier to buy electric cars, uh, you know, whatever, um, mm-hmm. yeah. So making it easy, but that's only one of the pathways uh, toward general more general positive uh actions with the environment what do you believe are kind of like the low-hanging fruit that the average citizen um could could do in their day-to-day life okay well let me start by quoting what you might or might not have seen a recent study that really was kind of shocking in a way but not shocking in a way it listed off the the carbon footprint of all the kind of usual things. And it said, what's the easiest thing you can do as a person to help the environment? And the answer after you hear it will be pretty obvious. But before you hear it, maybe not so much. Okay. So that all the other ones go like this and this one goes like that. And what do you think it was? Um, like six times more than any other thing that you're normally thinking about. Hmm. I, I suspect this is wrong, but I'm going to say like international flights. No, nope, that's one of the little ones. Okay. Okay. What's the big one? And people don't want to hear that either is have one less child. Yeah. Because it's a lifetime of carbon burning. Mm-hmm. And of course that gets into the whole population issue. But so we'll just put that aside <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's not very popular. It was interesting that they said, don't have any children. They, they phrased it in a softer way. Have one less child. Yeah. <laughs> but if we put that and one so aside. If, you're, if you decided to have no children, then you should just kill a child. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well. Don't get me started or, uh, you know, there are people who are talking about genocide as a good thing, but, you know, not, yeah. nobody's in favor of that. And then there's people who say that the only solution will be some kind of massive population uh, decline by the classic, you know, four horsemen of the apocalypse in the, in the yeah. beginning, fa- famine, war, disease, whatever, war. Or, yeah. and, I would uh, I would hope that, like, most people who are psychologically healthy they're going to be for the environment but first and foremost they're going to be for other human beings that only seems yeah well, um like, yeah most people i think yeah that's yeah. Right. yeah yeah and i'm fond of pointing out in a negative while we stay on the population thing just for a minute you know uh, in my lifetime which is not that long uh the po- global population has tripled Mm-hmm. And so when you think long term, this is definitely not a sustainable kind of rate of increase. Yeah. But uh, if we move away from, you know, population isn't our main topic here, but it is, it is the elephant in the room. And, you know, if there's yeah. if there were still a billion people on the planet, we probably wouldn't have any climate change problems. So it's definitely yeah. the elephant in the room. Now, I forgot yeah. what your question was. Uh, oh, what's the, what is the easiest low-hanging fruit? And apart from that... Uh, but I mean, I, I don't think that that actually makes a lot of sense. I, I, I think that that's a really, that's a really interesting thought. I never, I never really thought about it like that. Um, mm. Have one less child. Um, yeah, okay. Anyway, but ap- apart from that elephant in the room, <laughs> the other answer, I think, is diet because you can change it, you know, apart from social pressure, family, friends, but apart from those kind of pressures, you can change more or less on a dime without a whole lot of effort. And uh, diet is uh, a big thing. Beef is especially bad. And what's coming out now are finer 
uh, distinctions between different kinds of food. So for example, cheddar, according to one recent study, cheddar cheese is worse than some other kinds of cheese. So if you're really, mm. if you're really into the finer aspects of it, uh, diet is a big thing. Uh, but generally speaking, it's the the red meat that's the bad guy uh, yeah. for that. But so and that's the, what a what kind of proportion of that would be? What kind of uh, you know, of of say the average person's carbon footprint? How much would diet play into that? Well, the estimates vary because it depends if you take into account say the transport of animals or not, mm-hmm. or or you know the water they drink or not. But the the range of GHGs attributable to animals for food goes from a kind of a, a bottom of maybe 18% of on average up to if you start including the uh, ancillary aspects of that, like transportation, which are up to 35, 38%. So okay. I think a lot of people underestimate, you know, and, you know, if we just pick an average between the two, between 18 and 35, like a quarter or maybe even a touch more than a quarter. And mm-hmm. a lot of people either aren't aware of that or or just don't want to change, of course, that there's that. But but it's a, a big deal. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that's pretty easy is home energy use because we could all, in the winter, put on more sweaters. And, you know, that's pretty easy too. Again, a lot of people don't want to do it. But mm-hmm. uh, so those those are the easy ones, I think. I think... Air transportation, believe it or not, has a big uh, image, but actually so far, it's something like 4 or 5% of global emissions. It's, but on the other hand, it's apparently the fastest growing segment mm-hmm. of carbon. So, you know, the whole thing about flying is maybe overestimated so far yeah. compared to, say, diet. I imagine it's kind of a juicy target for some, though, because... It's a small percentage of people, even though it's only four or five percent. It's a very small percentage of our population actually causing that that damage. Whereas uh, everybody's eating. That's true. I don't know if it's a. I don't know. That's an interesting question. How many people take one a flight in a year? I have no idea, but I would guess it's. I guess I would guess that is more than four or five percent. But it, of course, everybody yeah. has to eat. You're, you're right about and that. And I, I guess. I mean, whether or not the data supports this, but I, I think this would maybe kind of be one of your uh, dragons of an action, the average person that's taking their one flight a year saying, well, well, that's necessary because I had to visit grandma, but it's these fat cats that are, you know, flying California, New York every week. Yeah. Um, those are the real demons. So I don't need to turn down my heat. Those guys need to, you know. Yeah, this is. Yeah one of the justifications there the other one that i like is the boss i call it in you know just simple language the boss made me do it yeah. uh, which means i took that flight but um i didn't really have to but i i tell people that the company wanted me to or or something like that so there's excuses uh, around probably unnecessary trips mm-hmm. i actually found a i was flying to uh, from Vancouver, uh, s- somewhere internationally, I think it was just for a vacation, um, and we ended up getting delayed. And I was, I met this um, person at the airport, and she was going on this trip with twelve other people for this meditation retreat in India for a week, and uh, and so I ended up having dinner with this group of people, and they were all very kind of, uh, in my mind, they're pretty self righteous. I. <laughs> I might be stretching a bit to say that, but they were, they were, there's this path network that they were, they were walking. Uh, they were kind of, I think they're around, um, they're somewhere on Vancouver Island. It doesn't matter. Um, and I guess there are these, these younger kids that were going into this path and cutting down a couple trees to make it better for mountain biking. And they basically stopped these kids from cutting down the trees and provided like kept the nature. And they were very proud of themselves for this. Meanwhile, they were flying to India to sit and think for a week. Yeah. So citing other people's sins is a, a very prominent justification. So, mm-hmm. for example, Al Gore lost a lot of uh, persuasive power because, oh, Al Gore lives in a big house. Yeah. Which is, of course, t- you know, maybe not the best thing, but he inherited it and whatever. 
uh, but what it does is take down his intellectual arguments with which are presumably correct by referring to something that's not directly related. But yeah, yeah. the the you're a hypocrite article or argument is uh, is uh, you're a hypocrite, so that justifies my bad behavior. <laughs> yeah, is it's not it's not logical or rational, but it's common. Yeah, a friend of mine sent me this chart of like the 20 most common logical fallacies. And that was one of them. I, for, I forget what they called that one, but it was, it was something like, you know, character defamation to discredit the yeah. argument rather, rather than addressing the argument itself. You know? Yeah, that, that probably, I think it came out of a, a recent issue of New, New Scientist. I, I subscribed to that because they put the dragons on the cover. So I subscribed to it. <laughs> <laughs> but there was an article about the 20 logic most common logical fallacies in there yeah yeah um so there was, there was actually one thing that was interesting to me as well so with some of the larger like there's the personal level the things that we can do turn down our heat that you mentioned uh we drive less get an electric vehicle recycle but as far as some people that want to reach out and do that next thing for the climate whether it's donate money or um, start some sort of local initiatives. To me, it's not just a matter of whether you act or not on climate. It's also a matter of prioritizing. So do you fund your you know, local sports team or do you fund um, maybe some ocean cleanup effort? So one guy that was really interesting to me is this... Uh, his name is Bjorn Lomberg, and he has this think tank in the U.S. Copenhagen Consensus Center. You, I, I guess you've you've heard of him. What yeah. do you, What do you think of his his ideas? Well, I, I haven't heard much about him lately, uh, but he he gathered a whole bunch of economists together ten years ago, probably twelve now. Time goes by. And they sat down and decided what were the most important problems in the world. And they wrote a book mm -hmm. or edited a book together. And collectively, they reinforced each other with the idea that climate change is real, but there's a lot of more important problems to solve than yeah. climate change. And they put it, you know, I'm sort of exaggerating here. They put it like, you know, number 18 out of 20 yeah. uh, based on some kind of uh, economists. Uh, so, of course, economists themselves vary in their opinions about these things, but he managed to gather together the economists who were willing or able to re reinforce each other's ideas that climate change is. So this is probably the, it's interesting, that's probably the the root of what I still call neo-denialism, that is, that it's happening, but it's not important. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's growing now. But he was saying that, I don't know, 12 years ago, something like that in this big book. Yeah. So... Uh, I don't know what he's talking about these days. Um, so I, I heard a podcast with him recently and um, it was, it was actually kind of, it was fortunate or unfortunate timing is right before we got in touch through the university of Victoria. Um, he, what he's done now is there's the 169 UN uh, goals. And I'm not sure if this is the same work that you're referring to. So, I don't re you know, I haven't looked at that book now for, for a while, so I couldn't tell you, but, I, I didn't think it had to do directly with the UN goals, but whatever. Okay. Yeah. So basically he's taken these 169 goals that uh, various countries came together and, and put forth. Hey, this is what we want to accomplish. And then they've assigned some funding, an, an actual amount of funding to go with this. And of course, there's no possible way that you can make a reasonable dent in all these goals with the amount of funding they've set forth. So rather than prioritizing, they're basically going to do none of them well. So he kind of did a similar thing. He, he, he tried to prioritize them, um, but he prioritized them based on $1 invested, how much you get back. So I think one of his top ones was giving women birth control um, in developing countries, because if you allow a woman to choose when she has uh, children or choose not to have children, you enable a lot more um, like not only social, but economic benefit in that, in that country and to that individual and economic benefit can be tied to, you know, actually climate change is like, um, the amount that people pollute is, is related to economic wealth from what he was saying. So he, he made a pretty compelling case. And, but of course, you know, he wasn't opposed in this, um, his interviewer, Jordan Peterson was, was in agreement. So I, I would be really interested to hear him 
speak with somebody that that opposed his ideas but he was he was certainly not advocating against climate change but he has this kind of like what you mentioned is neo-denialism um and i'm not necessarily for or against it i yeah. I'm not educated enough to, to have an opinion, but yeah, either this is the same thing that was in his book, or just a development of the same kind of ideas. It does. Let's like look that, at all yeah. the problems, and and of course also focusing on the economics of it. Mm -hmm. And it's attractive because certainly, you know, it's still the social norm in certain parts of Africa to have eight kids. If you don't, you're kind of a. a inadequate human being sort of mm. thing in your village so if, i'm not going to disagree with him on that point like i said before the one less child thing yeah uh but uh and i'm not an economist either uh i suspect however that that probably and this is only my speculation that he's uh devaluing some of the economic costs of of a climate change and overvaluing in others to support his point of view so for example even like the the insurance companies and and the reinsurance companies which you know the insurance companies for the insurance companies yeah are doing all kinds of things to uh toward positive action toward climate because they see huge costs from floods and storm surges and mm -hmm. drought and whatever so i'm not myself an expert on that but if the in if you know i, I would think in general insurance companies would in general be some of the last people on board but they are definitely heavily on board and they're yeah. counting dollars too so you know i think there's there's room for a debate on that yeah and i guess like you're your advice to the average person, if there's just a, you know, I guess there's no such thing as an average person. Nobody thinks they're average. But would you say that most people should just be focused on their personal impact or should more people kind of become activists or start looking to start some sort of grassroots movements or participate in a larger movement? Or do you think that it's it's enough to ask of most people to just try to reduce their impact where where they can? I think the the answer, well the first part of the answer thank you I think you were anticipating or you understand from taking a bit of psychology that you know people there's all kinds of people individual differences are the are the are the big thing and when I was in Ottawa talking to deputy ministers that's one of the messages I was trying to get across and of course they tend to think in terms of Canadians rather yeah, yeah. What a although foolish thing, yeah. that's not totally fair because they know Albertans aren't the same as British Columbians and yeah. whatever but if you get beyond the pro provincial level I think they still tend to think in terms of Canadians uh, mm. whereas we know that there are grandparents and there's millennials and there are uh, people on the left and the right and whatever so to answer your question I think uh, I think I'm a both and person that is uh, I think people should do everything they can in their own life and if you read the whole article on the dragons of inaction I, I call these people mules in okay. a, meant in a positive way they're already yeah. doing everything possible and I, I when I give talks I, I advocate that these people should get more recognition and more incentives or tax breaks or whatever uh, almost like income tax you know they should get you know, I, here's what I did last year, might have to be checked or verified, but, mm. and therefore I get a bigger tax break or something, or at least some local recognition. Uh, but the other, th but, and why shouldn't, yeah, I'm, I'm totally uh, awed by the, the youth movement that started by the, or most popularized by Greta, the, the Swedish young woman who's, uh, talking about everything and and the interesting thing on her side is that she's being very careful not to be a hypocrite she won't take a, a plane okay uh, so she won't fly anywhere uh she'll take a train and that's about it yeah and of course she's famous enough in some quarters that she could fly around and give talks and whatever so she's walking the walk and and all that so sure why shouldn't people well here's where i disagree and i had a uh a debate with a person on the current i don't know if you heard that interview or not the cbc show no no uh within new york who's ready to go to war this is a complicated uh kind of not a simple debate but there are people who think we should be in complete full full war mode and and you know even get into civil disobedience so there's as a far as protesting yeah protesting change. and whatever yeah and, yeah. They, and of course they think everybody should be of course but 
there's a group in Victoria that I'm part of actually that had a split because uh, some of them uh, actually did one in Victoria on the Johnson Street Bridge and block traffic. Mm -hmm. And so they thought that was the right thing to do. But the next day, the newspaper was reporting that, uh, you know, of course, it's anecdotal, one person. But, you yeah. know, I was trying to pick up my daughter from daycare and I couldn't get across a bridge. Well, I was thinking, mm -hmm. this person's not going to be too yeah. enamored of the cause when her she's separated from her, for, from her child. So these people think that kind of action is necessary. Other people think other kinds of action is necessary, writing letters or doing things. So it's, it gets to be a complicated thing. I always so, wonder, like, now certainly there's reasons to have, like, this type of civil disobedience and protesting, but I always wonder when there's people like that because it's it's pretty easy to take three hours and go out and block a bridge mm -hmm. how much is it for that kind of social credit and feeling like you've done really good and justifying your meditation flight to, to india um three weeks later and how much is it because you genuinely care about these issues and you really think that there's something some beneficial change going to happen because you blocked a bridge yeah i mean i think Again, both are true. There's a, there is a person who's going to block the bridge. And then I, my favorite uh, example it comes from an old talk I did at Royal Roads. But uh, and then the next day, they're going to fly to Costa Rica to look at the butterflies. That's, that's my favorite example. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's not fair to character, you know, the, 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 what I would call the bad guys uh, would tend to use that against all the protesters, but certainly some of these protesters also are what I call mules at home. They're mm -hmm. they're doing everything possible. They're not flying to Costa Rica to look at the butterflies or to India for meditation. So there's always a, a spectrum of people. And as soon as we start characterizing people as all doing the same thing, we're, yeah. we're automatically wrong right there. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so, but... Uh, I'm sure somebody blocked the bridge and flew down to Costa Rica, <laughs> but somebody yeah. else went and I, home. I guess I wasn't even trying to so much get at it from the hypocritical angle mm. as as much as do the people that are like that specific intervention that they're participating in. Are they doing it because of that internal group dynamic and or is, is do they really think that that is what is going to make a change? Like, I, and it guess it leads to a larger question. It's like, aside from just doing the mule activities that you, you kind of talked about, what would be a really effective way that somebody could engage with climate change at a, at a greater than, you know, N equals one? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, there's several answers to that. One is voting, as we just saw in Parksville. Uh, one is writing letters. Uh, another is... Uh, being a model, a visible model for other people, like riding a bike. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to do any, you know, arguing or anything. You're just out there riding your bike. And, you know, over the long time I've been in Victoria, I've seen an enormous increase in bike riding and bike lanes and whatever. And you, you know, people start to say, oh, that's, you know, that's a good idea. Maybe I should do that. You know, yeah. Because they see the, the mules in action. Yeah, and that's actually the CEO of my... I don't know who started it first. I've, I've only been working at this company for about eight months, but the CEO rides a bike to work, and the president does as well, and our graphics design guy does, and one of the engineers has bought some rain gear, and he's going to start yeah. riding biking to work. So, yeah, I, I think if it was started, maybe... Yeah, I and, think it because of the, the top and, and doing it. And what yeah. you're alluding to there is important too. It's uh, probably more important, perhaps unfortunately, but true, if key people, important people do it. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, again, I'm not exactly sure of my facts here, but I think the pre the president or prime minister of, of, of the Netherlands rides a bike too. And okay. so, you know, when the more you have somebody who's uh, important or... In some, again, in some quarters, the rock star or the, you know, doing it, uh, then as long as, you know, we think rock stars are probably hypocritical and they probably are. But anyway, somebody who people look up to doing it, then it becomes the norm or can become yeah. the norm. Yeah. And it's almost uh, kind of like what you said before about making the, uh, making the right choice easy is rather than having to overcome that social pressure, that, that kind of that kind of like a, that first person to go, first person to ride the bike, first person to ditch their truck for a car, um, 
that person can make it easier on the next people, which then make it easier for the next group of people to follow. Yeah, and even economically, I hear you talking, you know, anytime a new product is invented, a Prius or a bike or whatever, they always cost a lot at first when mm -hmm. there's not many of them made. Uh, and then the more that are made or used, the price per unit goes down and it yeah. becomes easier just simply in price wise uh, for more people to do it as well. Yeah. And like, that's one thing I really like at a, a company like, like Tesla. Um, so, I, I mean, can, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the free market. I, I think that, you know, if people are free to give choices, ultimately human beings in general are good and we're going to make good choices. Now, I think there's a lot of corruption and the free market is not completely free, but something like Tesla, where it's a profitable company that somebody, you know, it's hard to say what something's worth, but is this electric sports car worth a hundred thousand dollars? I mean, no more or less than a Corvette or a Lamborghini, but somebody can look at that purchase perhaps as almost like a donation. That's right. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're getting the product and they're getting everything that comes with that. But at the same time, they're taking that hundred thousand dollars and investing it or not even investing it, but, but giving it to a company that's doing the right thing rather than doing it to a company who's, you know, building a monster truck, right? You're, you're pushing through voting with your dollar, you're pushing, um, the economy and everything in the right direction. And you know that a company like Tesla, I mean, the next thing they've unveiled is now they're trying to do these more affordable cars. And I don't think they're going to try to go the opposite direction and make things unafford more on more unaffordable the next generation they're, they're trying to make it i think he's got a real vision of, of um, environmental sustainability yeah that's even a complicated uh, issue in my view i think first you should check the stock price and tesla i think they've had a, a big kind of stock crash lately so oh, they, i'm not yeah. so sure about i think they are having some difficulties but but anyway from the car purchaser's point of view it is a kind of a vote in the right direction mm -hmm. in fact uh, i walked to the university and uh, so you you know you walk every day and you notice things so i saw a house where for a long time there was a prius and now i notice there's a tesla there so they <laughs> they sort of went from a, a regular car to a prius to a tesla over a couple of years yeah. so there's this kind of progression aspect to it too Although I wonder with something like that, and now, of course, their Prius has been downcycled, so somebody else, instead That's of it. having a beat up old, you know, old car, now they have a, a Prius. But I wonder if we're kind of, sometimes it's easy to have these like consumerist impulses be hijacked by like the feeling that you're doing, doing something good, like by buying this $100,000 car with this super heavy lithium battery maybe is it better to just get another five years out of your your gasoline car rather than but I don't or know. i mean or the mule would the mule would say just don't buy another car at all yeah get on the public transport hello yeah. uh, on your bike or walk or whatever uh my son is uh a mule in that respect he has a very good job he could buy a car easily mm -hmm. but he chose to live his and this is what I tell my students too is you you look around for a place to rent or whatever one of the one of the simple things you can do you can't do it every day but uh when you change residences do your best to locate yourself close to your work or school so yeah. you don't have to drive it's you're, again it's making it easy based on a residential choice sort mm -hmm. of thing and so he could buy a, I'm sure he could buy even a Tesla, but um, so what he does is, is whenever he actually really needs a car, he he buys one, he uses one of those, uh, not Uber, whatever those other things, Modo or whatever those kind of things that are parked around in Vancouver. Yeah, and so uh, uh, so yeah, in fact, my other my other daughter has no car either. They they just. They just get along and they use a car when they really need one and they yeah. do their best to live as close as possible to their work. And, yeah. And, and I guess uh, that's kind of what I was getting at earlier. Like I like, in, you, you stated a lot better with something like Moto. Um, it's a better example than Tesla perhaps. So somebody's gone out and created this car sharing program, which is allowing your son to not make as big of a compromise while still making this really green choice. So a company like that, it's like, you know, they're enabling people. So that's, to me, something like that is doing is a lot, you know, just my gut feeling on that is like, I like what they're doing a lot better than something that would be just purely, oh, we're just a charity. Because when it's a charity, I feel like 
all of a sudden when you're not accountable to making a profit for me it just it almost uh yeah i just worry about accountability in, within the company it's like what are they actually providing whereas if you're doing something which is like leasing out these cars so people don't have to own them i just feel like now you have to be profitable so there's a certain efficiency it like imposes upon that organization um yeah yeah um i i agree okay yeah yeah cool um one of the uh when i was reading some of your material one of the uh the guys that came up to me is adam smith have you ever uh have you read any of adam smith's i never read the original but i know his basic philosophy yeah that, that's all i could read as well i've yeah. read as like a summary of it, of his works and he was interesting because he was an economist and as well as kind of like a a philosopher kind of psychologist self-appointed i'm not sure of his official training but he, economist uh, i think yeah by by trade yeah but he had this uh the theory of moral sentiments and a lot of the just reading some of your material as far as all these reasons that we don't act and then going back to look at our actions and justifying why we did certain things it really struck home um with some of his his writings there how he uh he feels that people are basically acting in just the way that their their routine is and then looking back and justifying their actions to be able to perceive themselves as this lovely creature mm -hmm. um yeah yeah i don't know much about adam smith kind of the founder or philosophical founder of free enterprise i guess or mm -hmm. justifier i guess of it in general but then uh, i didn't know about his moral sentiments part so yeah it's a, it's a very he's a he's an interesting guy because if you read his two like if you're i mean i haven't read them but if you look at the kind of analysis of these two big books one is a big proponent of the free market and it's just basically leaving people alone and not trying to have not intervening into the lives of, of people right he thought that anytime a government would intervene it would even for the, the best reasons it would have these negative consequences that were difficult to predict whereas at the same time on the personal level is his philosophy was almost the exact opposite right like how how much can you do to help people around you and you know not as a not to try to impose that upon people but it, it, it is it actually there it forms a quite a cohesive picture um but they seem at the surface they seem like his his personal ideologies and his government kind of economic policies seem quite at odds but hmm. yeah anyway um i was wondering if you could kind of provide like somewhat of a, a summary of the main of some of the like the highlights why the where the average person might have these um mental shortfalls like say the average listener at this podcast where they they believe in climate change what are some of the things that they should really reconsider in their life that they're doing um and like to think about where they're getting they're using these logical fallacies to justify their actions yeah that could be a, a very articulate way of asking what i often get asked by journalists which is usually what are the top three dragons okay yeah <laughs> but i i like the way you ask the question that's a that's a good one and when i just kind of cast my mind upon them i think one of the biggest uh ones that is probably pretty easy to overcome is i i i've i've uh, begun to just call it cga in my own my own acronym, but it means conflicting goals and aspirations and the the problem is that a lot of we all want to do a lot of things in life you know yeah. we uh even good things we want to donate more be charitable get exercise look after our kids whatever so these are legitimate other concerns so but they can be used as an excuse too that is i have to do this but you didn't really have to do that you could have done it donated more time to developing a more pro-environmental lifestyle so it can be cga can be partly real in the sense that you know if you didn't feed your kids you'd be in trouble mm -hmm. uh, and partly not real in the sense of using any of not just kids but whatever as an excuse so that's one 
And another one that catches my eye is what economists so call... So I guess like to prescribe that to the individual, like if you were to... Take, so to, take another look at your priorities, I yeah. guess, and say which ones are really real and which ones are kind of enabling you to do less for the environment. Mm-hmm. And is so, there maybe some intervention you could impose upon your life and, and just commit to that? Yeah. One yeah. thing I, I noticed in the military is that if you, if you have an operations center, say you have three people running it and there's a bunch of information coming out, it needs to be, you know, cycled and then basically pushed back like decisions have to be pushed out and given to the the, uh, whoever's operating in the field so it's always a hectic busy place all these decisions being made so often there's always a cry for more people but no matter how many more people you inject in the operation center they're they're always chaotic and busy and i think it's just because people in that environment when there's lots of decisions being made they find things to fill their time and the problem is actually if you put too many people in the operation center now all of a sudden you'll have these like spreadsheets and charts that have to be filled out and then they'll push these down to the the soldiers in the field oh fill out this fill out that fill out you know this report so it just turns into this um monstrosity and that's kind of what i'm wondering about what you're saying people are like I have my day is full from 6 a.m. when I wake up and I make lunch for make breakfast for the kids until 10 p.m. when I go to bed. Like, where could I fit this kind of intervention in? And in my mind, it's sometimes you just have to commit to it and force it into your schedule and room will just appear. Um, Oh, yeah, room will appear. You know, the whole thing about I'm busy uh, is completely a fallacy. In, mm-hmm. in one sense, what it really what it really translates to is I'd rather do this than that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and uh, uh, but to say I'm busy with whatever, um, again, you have to feed your kids. If we use kids as the example, but there's a whole lot of other things you don't have to do for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, I think most people, most people have seen Game of Thrones. They've seen you know they're 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 staying up with these major cultural like they're watching television they're consuming right. media there's always there's always time they're on their there's phones, always you know? time yeah yeah i mean in my own life i spent a lot i spent too much time watching tv when i was younger too much time watching baseball i'm a baseball fan i don't and i don't advocate everybody does exactly what i do but i'm down to one hour of tv per week and no baseball <laughs> yeah <laughs> because other things just seem more important and you know who even knows really who won the World Series last year anyway? Or, yeah. you know, or, how or, do you uh, <laughs> how do you measure that one hour? Oh, because I watch one show. Okay, uh, so you and just I watch this you're... one show every week, and that's yeah. all. That's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I know, yeah, from that. Yeah, another one that, uh, as I was saying, uh, two a couple of them as I kind of think about it. One is what the economists call sunk cost. So. Uh, a sunk cost is an investment, whether it's money or in time or whatever, and uh, that prevents or hinders you from doing the right thing. So the classic simple example would be you're a, a millennial and because uh, almost people older than that, most people own a car. So you buy a car and then you say, well, why should I take the bus? You know, I've got a car. It's depreciating. I'm paying insurance on it, mm-hmm. and car payments. And so... Sometimes a sunk cost is some, a choice that you've made that commits you. And you. Maybe you didn't realize it was going to commit you because you just saw it on the lot or somebody offered it to you for a good price. And, and then why should I leave this in, in the street and take a bus? You know? But yeah. the, the idea of a sunk cost can be applied to a lot of other things as well. Committing to this, committing to that, that you don't really have to do. Yeah, it's or, like that classic poker strategy where you get somebody to invest a bunch in the pot put a bunch of money in and now you can basically control them because they've bet so much that even if they don't have a great hand you can be as aggressive as you want and they've they've already made that investment and they feel like they're just going to keep up in the ante um whereas really they 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 should realize they should constantly reassess and back out when it makes sense to do so but people generally don't like to do that I see. That's a different example. I gave up okay. poker in high school, but uh, <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> uh, another one that's uh, probably important is uh, uh, I just create this jargon, actually, but I can tr- translate it: behavioral momentum, and that is just habits. You know, we can we have a lot of 
you know, really bad habits that everybody knows about, but we have also habits that aren't morally a problem, but are, uh, or health wise aren't a problem, but prevent us, you know, uh, we, we don't like to admit it, but we're pretty much habit driven creatures for the most part. So if we develop a certain habit and it's not good for the climate, it's very easy that's why I call it behavioral momentum. You know, we just mm -hmm. tend to do the same thing. So what's the answer to that? Well, examining your daily life and seeing which habits you really need to break. Yeah. So one study from the Netherlands <clears throat> found, for example, that people made the biggest pro-environmental change in their life when they changed residence uh, because that was the opportunity to start doing something different than what mm. they were doing in their old residence. But of course, we can do that without changing residences as well. But he found that was the biggest time that people actually made changes was when they moved. Yeah. I've always wondered, it's, I don't know if it's a nature versus nurture question, but like how many real decisions do most people make in their lives? You know, I think it's a real decision when in Ontario, anyway, when you go from grade eight to grade nine, you decide, am I going to take academic math, like university math, or am I going to take applied workplace math? And, you, you, you know, that decision and, you know, maybe the friend group you associated in grade nine, like it drives an amazing amount of your life. And like this kind of idea, like, oh, just, just re-examine your life. It's like, and, and not even just related to climate change, related to all sorts of things that, I mean, the same kind of dragons of inactions could pre prevent people from doing. It's like, I sometimes I feel like people people make very few real decisions. It's just, they're just, they, something starts the ball rolling in their life and it just continues down that pathway. I remember when I got out of the military and, you know, when I got into the military, most of my family and friends thought it was insane because I didn't come from a military family. But then also when I got out, people were kind of flabbergasted that I would get out of a stable job. And it's like, I mean, not that I, you know, but it's like, well, guys, I'm, I'm getting out of the, the military. Like I could, I could be sent to war. You, you'd think that's like, I, I, you'd think it would be the less risky move, but just the fact that I was making a big change in my life was so almost unnerving to people. Yeah. I think you're right that people don't make too many real decisions apart from <clears throat> buying this versus that in the grocery store or something, you know, yeah, but trivial yeah. decisions, but big, big decisions. Yeah people fall fall into it or let other people talk them into it or, or whatever. Because I'd say like something like taking the bus instead of driving a car, that's a big decision for most people, you know, because it's, it's, you know, I could take the bus once if, if it is very convenient. I don't take the bus. And I mean, I'm, if I'll, but it would, if I were to start taking the bus to work, that, is, that affects a lot of my life. That's a, that's a big decision. Um, so I, I do really think like, you know, I, I, totally agree with what you said in there it's like if you want to have a significant change you really need to have some time set aside to contemplate your life and really what you need to do um and i and i guess i'm not talking specifically about ch climate change necessarily but like what you want out of out of this life too right how do you how do you think about that as a as a psychologist um <clears throat> well one of the things about making decisions is that there's always some risk involved and that's a, a whole genera of the dragons of inaction is mm -hmm. maybe not necessarily physical risk or whatever but social risk uh, yeah people might tease you for taking the bus or doing or becoming a vegetarian or uh, um, functional risk if i buy a tesla will the batteries give out or will will i be able to find charging and and the kind of stock here i am talking about people in general when i don't believe it myself but yeah. let's just say many people mm -hmm. are risk averse they do so they rather keep on the same path yeah. uh, because going off it is social functional temporal six kinds of risks actually and so yeah. people avoid risk yeah and like I think one of the trickiest parts of climate change is you're, it's not a very good balance of risk, right? You have a, a certain amount of risks that are very real and, and visceral to most people, like social ostrac ostracization. I don't know how to say that. Ostracism. Ostracism compared to the risk of climate change, which is very nebulous and, you know, 
things are going to be bad, yes, but you know, what exactly happens is difficult to quantify. People have all sorts of doomsday restrictions. Some people, and of course, and then there's the extreme deniers, which say, you know, it'll be barely anything. And, you know, Donald Trump esque, oh, yeah, temperature's nicer today. So obviously, climate change is great. But, but it's just a, it's a nebulous thing. Whereas if you have a big, which is very difficult, even like I said, to change jobs, if you're changing jobs or changing cities, there's very real risks of doing that. But there's also very real risks and very real pain that you're experiencing at the moment. So there's a lot more impetus behind like making that decision, whereas climate change is particularly hard. So me, for example, if I were to start taking the bus to work instead of the car, there's no real like tangible payback for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that gets into one of the other <clears throat> main problems and that's this sense of uh whatever i do doesn't matter very much mm -hmm. uh, because the payback isn't right now and um one more pit person taking the bus is just not going to change except it changes a lot for me but not for anything else yeah so that's a difficult one because uh Lack, we, lack of perceived behavioral control, basically, or lack of feeling that you have agency or an impact on things. So, you know, my, my stock answer to that one is, you know, if people bring that one up, I usually say, so you, I guess you don't believe in voting either, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even if they don't vote, they believe in voting because yeah. every vote counts, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's true one vote doesn't really count but if everybody thinks that then blah 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 and if, yeah and if, if once everybody's voting or most people are voting it does make a difference so you have to think of yourself i think as uh part of um, a movement if you want to, to use that word uh yeah it's not just me taking the bus it's us t changing to the bus and i'm just part of us yeah and yeah. people do like to belong to a group yeah like yeah, that so, and, yeah so. and i also think that it you know, one person changing the bus, it, you know, things are, are built on tipping points, right? Yeah. That, that extra person taking the bus could be the impetus, like not only for other people to take the bus, but perhaps, um, now they have an extra bus. So that instead of coming every half hour, now it comes every 15 minutes, which yeah. maybe makes it far more convenient for everybody to take the or bus. Or even, you know, where I live, there was a question about discontinuing a route because not enough people were taking the bus. So you mm. can, can go the other way too, down to no bus. Yeah. <laughs> and so which forces you to uh, use other means. Yeah. Yeah. So those that's important, uh, you know, other, other agendas that I have in my life not making a big difference all by myself, habit, sunk costs, you know, these are probably some of the most important individual dragons or, or clusters of dragons. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Um, right about an hour here. So uh, do you want to wrap it up for there? Any, uh, any closing remarks? I, I would just challenge people listening to really examine your life and try to overcome any of the excuses that you're using that when you really think about it are excuses that you really could do a better job. You could at least write a letter to an MLA or an MP. There are things that you can do. Just don't even take all that much time. Maybe it mm -hmm. means... Uh, a protest, but I wouldn't block a bridge. Uh, yeah. But uh, forming a group within a neighborhood, for example, uh, blue boxes apparently started with one woman holding, bringing her friends over for coffee uh, when at a time when most women weren't working in the neighborhood, and they started talking about what they could do in that in North Vancouver. Right. And, and that's supposedly the origin of all the blue box movements. Wow. Is this group of women just having coffee in the morning because they weren't working. Yeah. <laughs> and, one of, and one of them sort of saying, hey, we could do something here. We could do something here. So Just like a grassroots. A, gra a true like grassroots yeah. thing. And, and people get a lot of, uh, what can I say, a lot of personal benefits i guess you could say from being with other people doing something mm -hmm. i guess that's my other 
important messages do do it with somebody else who cares and yeah. it's like going to the gym you know like going to the gym by yourself you don't do it half the time but if you're going to the gym with you're pulling that person sometimes the other person's pulling you sometimes well it's the same yeah. thing with climate change let's all pull each other along yeah okay great well thanks so much for your time robert uh it's greatly appreciated you're welcome Thanks for listening to my conversation with Robert. As always, I love to hear feedback from listeners. Look me up on Twitter at Contra underscore podcast or email at ContraPodcast at gmail.com.